Hello, good afternoon. May I request everybody outside to please come inside the hall? disruption of this continuing continuum between the education industry, the education institution, the learner, and the enterprise. Right. Next. One speaker in the morning brought this up. To me, this is the fundamental difference that the skilling industry or the education sector and the enterprise needs to understand. So first I'll talk about, all of you know, what is knowledge? Knowledge is what an employee needs to know. What is skill? It is what an employee needs to be able to do. It's not good just knowing, it is about being able to do. And just one speaker in the morning spoke about attitude. And I'll talk about examples here. Indian nurses abroad. Thousands and thousands of Indian nurses have gone to the Middle East, Australia, US, UK. You can count on the fingers of both hands how many of them have risen to administrative leadership level. And the single biggest issue that comes in is not language, but it's about confidence, soft skills, attitude. There's a whole quotient around it, right? And then the line on top, skilling is about identifying gaps in a competency framework and then figuring out what that job and that competency requires for a person who knows to be able to translate to not just knowing but to be able to do. Many sectors have done this very well. So every job level you take fitting. 101, 102, 103 in fitting should be able to, or a carpentry, or masonry, or plumbing, should be able to identify the competencies for that job, and then adequately skill the employee to be able to meet that competency. And that's the fundamental difference that, that needs to be achieved. Next. I decided that I will provocatively put one or two models that I believe, and I've been on both sides, I've been on all three sides, I've been a learner, I've been in industry, and as a provider of both education and skilling. There are two models that I believe has worked, and we need to adopt. Both are around work integrated learning programs, WILPs. I talk about an educational institution driven WILP. Bits Pilani runs probably the biggest, most successful work integrated learning program started at Wipro. Vivek Paul was the first CEO of Bits Pilani, ran a massive program of giving masters to engineers at Wipro while they were at Wipro. So Friday afternoon to Sunday, Wipro offices were converted to 
learning sessions, classrooms. And they attained a master's degree from Bits Pilani. Any regulators here? I am going to provoke. It was deemed at that time irregular. It was deemed this is a degree that you cannot award. I was in the Manipal system. We ran masters, MS as we called it, in integrated and embedded systems, semiconductors. In 2010, 11, 12, 13, I had Honeywell Corporation give me six batches of 60 each, their premises. And the regulator termed it as illegal. MS is Master of Surgery, can't be Master of Science, though the rest of the world recognizes that as that. That being that, they said, you are an institution based in Karnataka, and you are in Manipal, and you are running this program in Bangalore. And you are not allowed to. Today, the Apollo Hospitals is the largest employer of healthcare workforce, single entity in the country. The horizontal I, I lead across all Apollo entities is Apollo knowledge, education, training, workforce development. We have a university in Chittur, where the founder is from. We run easily the most competent health sciences programs integrated with industry. What I cannot do from the Apollo University is train Apollo nurses across 72 Apollo hospitals. Because I'm a state university, and my geographical boundaries are restricted within the state of Andhra Pradesh. And that's why I say, so I've given an example. University of Waterloo runs, and there's an example for the, for the educational institution. University of Waterloo runs one of the most competitive, sought after programs called Co-op, same work integrated. It's 14 terms, three terms a year, so four and a half years of engineering. Acceptance ratio is in the low single digits. Out of the 14 terms, a student has to do a minimum of five work terms, paid work terms. It's not free internships that your father got for you at his friend's place. They have a work portal called Waterloo Works. A student prepares his or her resume. Every term it is updated. They apply. They get interviewed. How do I know that? My son's there. They, the entire cohort on the co-op program is placed in their 10th, 11th, 12th uh, terms by industries where they have worked and many of them try and design the last two terms, eight months in the company they want to join. So 14 terms, minimum five, most kids take six work terms. Guess what my son tells me? You don't need to pay for my living expenses, I earn it myself. It, it teaches kids not just to get your resume, not just to learn, but to apply for jobs. It teaches them what the workplace is about. He grips a lot. For you managers, he, he labels his managers with me as new managers, don't understand we are students and so on. But they are job ready. At the end of their engineering, they are job ready. <coughs> we don't have a single co-op program from an, from an higher education degree awarding institution in India. Right? I gave you the example of Bits Pilani and I started on the right side with Enterprise, Manipal University. I really do believe that if we have to stop talking about this and get on with it, we need to do work integrated learning programs, I'm sure. We'll talk about apprentice program and so on and so forth. But we need to provide the ability not just for a learner to provide a bridging to industry, but for a worker to continue learning whilst on the job. A nurse cannot leave an ICU she is working in to go to an educational institution in some other state. She has to be taught when her shift ends at the same hospital. Now she wants a degree award. We should have the ability to award her a degree. What is the solution? Like all good Indian entrepreneurs, we have a Jugaad solution. So you do a 11 month, 15 day program. Not a 12 month program, so you hide under the radar of the regulator. Why should we be doing that? Why should an enterprise not be competent? And this is a whole hospital. And for this, you know, you can talk about a whole max. Why can't we be, uh, be uh, able to award degrees, not just by ourselves, partnering with an institution. And if I believe I should partner with Apollo University, or Max believe they should partner with my university or Manipal University, why should geography of the university come into this? We are both health sciences focused universities. So 
to me there is the solution and i really do believe that the government needs to be an enabler to remove these artificial barriers otherwise you know all of you have heard narayan murthy say this 30 years ago 70% of engineers are for industry our own nursing colleges apollo is the largest educator and trainer of nurses have to go through 90 days of induction at our own hospitals it's a travesty they should be job ready when they join our hospital when they don't next please uh, we'll talk about the employee link incentive program my only comment on this is it probably needs to be spread beyond manufacturing to other sectors and beyond first time to other employees because a lot of companies and enterprises productivity or competitiveness doesn't come at entry level. It actually comes at mid level and other employees. That's where the learning has to happen, right? And there needs to be an incentive to provide that. Next. So, now you see I put four st uh, stakeholders on the slide. So there's the government, there's the learner, there's the enterprise, and there's the educational institution. And I was having a conversation with my namesake Shiva from ENY and this guy from Desh Pandey. There are two or three fundamental learnings that I have imbibed through experiments and pilots in skilling. Every stakeholder has to have skill in the game. Skilling does not work with one stakeholder having no skill in the game. I.e., there should be no free course for learners. Learners need to pay for the courses. At Manipal, we ran large pilots in Orissa near Shapurji Palunji cement plant. Ran cohorts where we gave batches of 30 free skill with a job guarantee. After 15 days, none of the 30 turned up. We charged 500 rupees to three other cohorts and promised them a job and a refund of the 500 rupees plus an incentive of 50 rupees, 10% on that. 13 out of 30 in one cohort. 17 and 16 respectively finished the course, joined the plant. Right. The same holds for enterprise. We've heard this. I don't want to name enterprises. How many enterprises, and I asked the question at Apollo Hospitals myself, how many of the enterprises are willing to pay a premium, this came up in the previous discussion, pay a premium for skilled labor versus unskilled labor? For that job, I'm not talking, please don't take skilling and unskilling at a very macro level. For a job competency, if I have that job competency, phlebotomist, if I know how to draw blood out without hurting the patient, without causing air bubbles, the right amount, why should I not be paid more than someone who's just learning by experimenting on your risk and my risk? Right? So, to me, that is the future of workforce development. I think we need to get programs which involves all stakeholders having skill in play. I think that's the end of my slide. Next, it's probably should say thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, may I now request the moderator, or Mr. P. Mojidharan, sir, to please take on the meetings. Thank you very much. Uh, I think all of you had a nice lunch. I think it's good to see a lot of people sleeping. So I've told all my speakers here, our first job is to wake you up. The best way to wake you up is to be provocative, ask difficult questions, and maybe some of you may carry away some thinking from that reflective questions. I think that's the most important thing we want to do. The format is going to be like this. I, I will speak a little bit initially, a few questions. Then we'll, each of them will speak for five minutes on uh, the program. The topic is very clear. And I think I'll frame that question to each of them about not what the scheme is, what the scheme is doing. I want to talk about what the scheme is not doing. That's where the story is. The real story of skill development, I, I've been here in 2010. We were one of the first partners of NSBC. I distinctly remember the passion and the audience was full of young people who wanted to put money in the skill industry. We all came from IITs and IIMs, many of them came to the room if you want to do something for the country. 14 years later, people have changed, but the stories have remained the same. The most important thing of the last 14 years is beautifully described 
I am being very candid. Uh, please don't mind. The DC is also here. <laughs> I think they are my funding party. There is a beautiful story in De Bono's book. It is called New Thinking for the New Millennium. In that story, there is a ship on the highway, on the high seas. Everything is going wrong. There is a mutiny, food is lousy, newspapers are leaking, water is leaking, generator is not working. Then they bring a new captain by helicopter. Everything changes. Food is improved, generator is working, uh, people are very happy, no mutiny. With only one problem, ship is going in the wrong direction. This is our story of skill. What I mean by that is very simple. Who are the most important stakeholders in skill movement? This job seeker. Unfortunately, he is not here in this room. Actually, I would like to see some panelists from the people who are looking for jobs. All of us are giving Gyan what he should do. Right? But they have no voice in the entire system. The second thing, which is very important, we missed out was MSMEs are the only employers in this country. Even though I respect Apollo, Apollo is, is probably a producer of workforce for the rest of the industry. People uh, pull people from Apollo and therefore you supply to the industry. I respect that. But MSMEs is, is where the jobs are. And if you go on class, we have done one million, one million job seekers. We have met, we have interviewed, spent time. TMI group has been there for 30 years. So we keep asking them, what is your problem? They are giving you, government is giving you a job, uh, giving you a training free of cost. Some of them even give you lunch, right? And then you don't want to go and work. What's the problem? He says, you guys don't understand our problem. Okay, what I will do? I'll come, finish the course. Then what happens? Company will come and pick me up. I'll join the company. I realize unskilled labor is getting 1% lower than what I'm getting. There's no skill premium in entire industry. The minimum wages itself has got a very small skill premium. I think, I think we should look at that very closely. If there is no skill premium in minimum wages from unskilled to semi-skilled, why the hell will I come and work, take a skilling for what? Second thing he says, where are the jobs? I have to leave my house, travel to some other place to look for a job. Migration is the absolute reality. It may not be just the village you can't get a job. If you are in smaller towns, move to smaller town, to smaller town. The salary is the biggest elephant in the room. Nobody wants to talk about it. NSBC won't talk about it, Vicky won't talk about it, all of us won't talk about it. But the compensation has been stagnant in the industry where I work. We work in large numbers in BFSI, Banking Financial Service Insurance. The same thing in IT industry. In the last 10 years, salary has moved up by 10%. When the average inflation is 4%, it should have gone up by 48, 50% should have gone up. It remained stagnant. Why? The more people are available, the less demand. If you buy onion, you go to the onion market, onion supply is more than the demand, onion price will fall. So what we have done fantastically with a lot of energy is to create a supply side intervention. Created a lot of supply side, go to colleges, go here, go there, increase supply, increase supply. The one side is not involved. So what has happened? Price is the single most reason why most single person in the industry, in the, in the families want to join skill movement is because of compensation. It's pathetic in this country. I use the word pathetic. Because I've studied it very closely, we published papers on this. He talked about countries outside of India. The big, big storytelling is always about Switzerland, Germany. You look at the compensation of the skilled labor there. They're better than back office guys. Here, a person who's selling Swiggy makes more money than so-called skilled guy. So I think I'll stop here because the apprenticeship scheme and the other scheme we're going to talk about. The two good questions I want to ask the panelists very closely. You pay some money to apprentice. At the end of apprentice, what happens? He gets a job. But how do we ensure he gets a sustainable job? That means he doesn't go out of pocket, he doesn't lose money and go back. That's the first question. The second question is, what should we do in the scheme to ensure that they win in the first job? Let me give you some two important data points for you to know. Today, after taking a job from the campus, 
80 percent of the people after three months are looking for another job because they realize they got the wrong job, wrong company, wrong industry, wrong salary, everything else. Nobody has ever told them before you went and joined that company. We met one of our big customers and he says, in the first one month after joining, attrition is 50 percent of the people leave. How is it possible? We have put a lot of money, put training, all this bullshit, but at the end of the day, they say, people say, it's not the job I want to do. Then why did you come into the program? Well, nobody ever told them, this is the reality of the job. So in fact, I want to stop you with saying a very important point. I firmly agree with many of us in this room, Sanjay will agree with me. I was unskilled after IIT and IIT. I got skilled by my job, first job. None of us was got skilled. This whole theory of high funda skill, 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 skill is confusing me because I was not skilled. Were you skilled and you joined campus? Skilled in something else. We put in presentation, we will do all this. On the job, the job which you did, we learned only in the job. So I think it's also important. Companies are now saying, you also mentioned it, attitude is far more important than skills. Attitude to serve, attitude to learn on the job. Many of those attitudes are not there. So anyway, I'll stop here. I'm going to start off from you on the first point. The question is, the apprenticeship program is already there from 2016. We are understand correctly. It's about eight years now. It's got some numbers on the table. It's a cumulative number, not an annual number. For a country like this, let me give you another statistic. There are 10 million people who are passing out of campuses every year. 10 million. It's not a small number. And we get excited about 7 lakh people over 8, day, eight years getting into apprenticeship. Only graduates I'm not talking about non-graduate segment. So we are a country of numbers. See, you talked about a good example of its pyramid. Very good work integrated program. We also talked about skilling. Our problem is not the top 1%. Our problem is the bottom 10%. Those guys don't want a job. They're not making money. They are on the street. So our skill movement, originally when we conceived, we went for quantity, thinking that we will support these guys up from there. But we're still struggling. So I'll stop here. Over to you. I want to hear your thoughts on how do we make the scheme more effective? And what are the three things the employer should do? And how do you prepare the youth to accept this as a reality? Because if they don't accept this reality, we can all run around in circles. But you will go there, apprenticeship program, you will leave. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you for, uh, for a wonderful question. And uh, first of all, I would like to start on a positive note that uh, the employment link incentives, you know, what government has proposed, it's definitely a positive step. It's, it exemplifies that, you know, the, the government is serious about job creation, financial and social impact, and youth empowerment as well. So I, I, I work with a company called NLB Services. We are a global talent solution provider. And uh, I can absolutely say that in today's land, uh, talent landscape, jobs are not created you know, uh, like this. Jobs are created with the right investment, strategy, vision, and the incentives. So what the government of India has proposed, I think it's the right step towards building the future workforce. Now, you know, there will definitely be steps which would be required to make sure that uh, the scheme is effective, efficient, and it's sustainable as well. So to make it happen, uh, there has to be a continuous awareness uh, towards, uh, you know, candidates, employers, constantly evaluate what are the value propositions and benefits for, for both of them, and then ensuring that there are, um, you know, community engagements at every level to ensure that this information is going to the wider audience. That's the first step I think uh, should be done. Second, we need to use the right combination of technology and human intelligence. You know, uh, with technology, there can be a lot of data gathering. There should be a feedback mechanism to understand what is working, what is not working, what needs to change. And whenever there is a red flag and something which is highlighted to be changed, there should be a quick response adjustment, adjustment mechanism as well to make sure that the scheme is relevant. The third point, which in my opinion is uh, tailor-made training programs. You know, um, when we talk about skill-based hiring, we have seen a paradigm shift in the last, say, five years or so, where, uh, where the companies are looking to build capabilities rather than just filling a role. So when it's about you know, uh, scaling up the skill-based hiring, 
and maintaining the quality and consistency, it's, it's the need of the art. That's the demand what the industry has today. And with these skill-based initiatives, thousands of ITIs are you know, getting upgraded and uh, designing and defining the curriculum, which would be relevant to the job market. I think over the period of five years, you know, the, the kind of investments what government is talking about, we will definitely see a needle moving in the positive direction. And uh, with a lot of data analysis and data gathering, I'm sure this will become more accessible, sustainable, and relevant for the industry as well. Thank you. Okay, one question I want to ask you. I think one of the biggest challenges in this program is also the money that is being paid, both uh, to the company and the individual. Is that money attractive enough for the employer to create new jobs, or it is going to help in formalization of workforce? I think the journey has to start from somewhere, and uh, that's what we see in the, uh, in the proposal from the government. Though the money is not significant or sufficient, but we also need to understand that the industry demand uh, uh, is there for the right talent. And if this program can you know, even cover 10%, 15% of those skill-based talented pool, I think this will be a success. And I'm sure over the period of time, we will see the sophistication of the scheme as well. Thank you. Uh, I'll not uh, repeat too many things what my fellow uh, panelists has said, but uh, just to, yeah, so myself, Bhavna Kripal I am not from manufacturing because whenever I say I work with the hero group, a lot of people understand that uh, I come from manufacturing. Uh, I represent a company which is renewable energy arm of Hero Group by the name Hero Future Energies. We are an IPP, independent power producer in renewables. And I think the sunshine sector of the country, I must say that. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll touch the sustainable part first uh, for these schemes. Uh, we are corporate sector and we are the major actually end users of these schemes. And what we realize is uh, that apart from the salary or whatever inputs are going, uh, budgets are allocated by the government, I feel that at least, and again adding to what he said, that we made a big thing. That is important. And this is a journey. When we will be able to achieve 100% results, time will tell. But at least we started doing it. The most important uh, consideration here is that gradual improvement has to be there in the schemes which will only happen that we have a robust stakeholder engagement program so stakeholder engagement and communication is very important which includes a very effective feedback mechanism so employers are asked where is the gap the students are asked where is the gap and what challenges you face when you enter the workforce and then the entire mechanism of it what skills are required and are we tapping those or we are working on skills which actually are available in abundance and that is why the frustration comes both for employer as well as the job seekers so that dialogue continuous dialogue and then and system which allows implementation of changes it shouldn't have been that this is stone in cast one system and continue for next 10 years no so this feedback mechanism should be fed up as an implementation uh, process so that improvement can happen. And then scheme can become more effective. It, every year, every two years, we do the tweaking. Third is, I feel that outreach has to be increased, ensuring that inclusivity is important. Like, are we catering to only, and here I bring the female perspective as well, or all genders, that are the schemes only for, so when we say manufacturing, largely people think, oh, boys or male. Are we ensuring that these schemes have an entry for female workforce or for third genders? Are we only, again, we've said it focuses mostly on manufacturing. There are so many other sectors. We should have uh, a mechanism to tap those. And I'll take example of renewables. Uh, so government had, uh, had to. This release the scheme of Surya Mitra and Pavan Mitra, which were three months programs. So they are being employed in our sector. And our sector, so much work is happening, and I still feel that there's a gap that we have not analyzed the.
not analyze the demand of the of all the sectors. So I think if we focus on these, uh, then both the satisfaction level of both job seekers and as well as job givers, I think we can reach a better ratio on that. I hope I answered what you want. So frankly, it's a starting point. We're just starting the conversation first. We get deeper into it. I think for your information, I was just reading 40 sectors and 259 trades are covered. So the problem is the word trade. What you say trade, everybody thinks it's manufacturing. But actually trade is a common terminology which we use even in the service sector. Right? And I think many of you may not be aware that if you look at job creation today, the largest the ratio of people to job creation in manufacturing versus service sector completely op opposite of what everybody expects. Manufacturing does not create jobs, and even it creates jobs, attrition rates are so low, there are no new people entering that sector. Today morning we talked about JW Steels, and they are a very large company. If you look at the total number of employees, once I was studying the total number of employees in Tata Group, seven lakh people. That's it. So I think. The manufacturing sector is a great place, an ambitious place, but the real jobs are in service sector. They are in banking, they are in financial services, they are in insurance. So I think the bigger challenge for us is also to realign our terminology to make it attractive for people to come into the service sector. So I want to invite uh, Dr. Guru Raj Nehru to talk about the student side. See, none of us know why students are not hitting the door. There are a lot of people are registering, I know, on the portal. But what has been your experience talking to students? Are they serious about this kind of program? Do they see the employer treat them well when they go on apprenticeship program? Do they see a value in the entire program? I think he doesn't want me to talk. Thank you very much. And uh, before I say something, I think uh, when I was hearing uh, Venkatesh Ji, I think it was apparent to me as if I was talking about my university. Uh, I come from Sri Vishwakarma Skill University, started in 2016, the first skill university in India. And what uh, is very important to share that we were the first university in India to introduce work integrated uh, education. Now, when this work integrated education comes up, it's not about the uh, uh, white collar jobs, it's about the blue collar jobs, how we integrated these blue collar jobs in our uh, skill based programs. So the beauty is that the NAPS, the National Apprenticeship Program that we are talking about, we have integrated it in all of our programs where industry doesn't have the capacity to exercise because there's a limitation of 10 to 15 percent. The industry goes beyond that and uh, we sign different type of contracts with industry. But none of our programs, starting from class 9th, which is a BCBSC, until PhD, we have every program having an industry integration element inside it. As far as uh, programs starting after class 10th, every program has a mandatory on-the-job training. And this on-the-job training is uh, aligned with specific job roles. Like you know, we have NSQF approved job roles. Hello. So all of our programs have a partnership like I see many of my industry partners sitting here with whom we run undergraduate programs, diploma programs, master's programs. The one point that Dr. Venkateshwaraji raised about the geographical boundaries, we all know university, state universities have a geographical boundary. However, we have also addressed that where the uh, educational element happens in the campus, the on-the-job training happens outside campus, outside the state. And one of the examples is the JBM. Uh, just now, I can see some of the folks sitting here, Babiri Gupta Ji. Most of our students who go through undergraduate program in, say, Tool and I in robotics, 
they do not work only in the JBM plants in Haryana. They work also outside Haryana, maybe in Maharashtra or maybe in Madhya Pradesh plants of JBM. And this is the model which we emulate with almost 150 companies that we are running, around 50 programs and 3,000 students in the campus. As far as the schemes are concerned, this scheme, I was closely reading these schemes and the first thing we have to keep in mind, does it really excite industry? So I'm sure because we have also been part of the various focus groups where the finance ministry had invited us to share suggestions. I'm sure these, uh, the scheme has come up after the consultation of industries. But in any case, even if this has an excitement element with industry, I think the beauty is it will facilitate uh, the formal sector jobs in the market today that we have, you know, we have more than 80% of the informal market job you know, employees in the country. But with the introduction of this first time employee coming in the industry with the 15,000 rupees spread to three months, it will significantly encourage the youngsters to go and look for formal job markets. Now, how employer will be impacted? Because employer, especially in the manufacturing sector that the scheme B they have introduced, where the government is going to contribute around 24% of EPFO first year, 24% second year, 16% third year, and 8% in the fourth year. The thing is today, the NAPs which we are talking about, the biggest challenge today in industry I have personally experienced is when students who are in educational institutions, they are engaged as apprentices under the NAP scheme. If a student is in a relevant field, for example, student is in plumbing or electrician or automobile or data entry or any other job role where the ITI or diploma programs or degree programs are offered, the challenge comes when the students are not engaged in the apprenticeship program for the relevant job. They are engaged in the industry, but then they are placed in different types of menial jobs. And that significantly impacts the learning curve of the student. The student was supposed to go and apply the classroom learning on the shop floor in the specific areas of uh, jobs that we are supposed to be aligned with the curriculum for which he or she was going through the program in the institution. But what happens is, most of the times I have seen, industry doesn't re really bother about it. They are worried about the 15% that they have to enroll, but then the engagement of apprentices doesn't happen on the relevant job roles. That impacts the morale of the student, learning of the student, and eventually what happens that when the student completes his or her program, they are not fully skilled. And eventually when the, they apply for the jobs, they are not actually job ready and thereby the value for their qualification diminishes. What I see in this scheme is that the manufacturing sector scheme integrated with the scheme A that is for the fresh um, employees, it will put a constructive pressure, whatever the amount it is, it's a significant amount, 24% in first year and second year, it will put a significant thrust on the industry to create and improve the conditions of work at workplace. Because the scheme says, in the, in the new employee scheme says, that only reimbursement can be given when an employee has completed one year. So means uh, the employer will have to now innovatively think about how to get the benefit of the scheme by ensuring the stick stickability, retention of this employee for at least one year and only then they will be eligible to claim the benefit amount. Otherwise, they will have to return the money that has been reimbursed to the employee in the first month, first uh, installment or second installment. So I find this is going to significantly improve uh, the conditions of the work and uh, consequently it will help an employee to learn skills. I'll stop here, there are so many things, but because time is less, so... I think you made a first very powerful point that this is not to be done because legislation says 15% have to be onboarded. It should be done with a lot more objectives. And people should be going through an apprenticeship program on this trade or what they have learned and they should be aligned to that, right? So the question 
Dr. Nehru, I want to ask you two questions. One question is, how does it impact the next batch of students who are coming in our apps? Because the feedback goes from student to student. Does it impact the next batch in terms of Murray and Tony for this kind of program? The second question, I think it's more open to Sanjay also can answer it because you've been in the industry on the other side. Why are employers doing this? Why are they doing this? They're, they're, they're not dumb. Right? They're also smart guys. They also run a business. I have 3,000 employees. Right? We are also concerned. We also want to run a business. We want to make money. Why are they not doing it? What is it that we're missing? Which doesn't make the employer grab these guys. I think that's the question. I'll ask Dr. Nero to answer these two questions. Then we'll pass it on to him. I think that's a fantastic question and it's not about the next coming batch of the apprentices, it's about the existing batch of the apprentices because if you go and check with many industries, uh, you will find a lot of uh, attrition among the existing apprentices as well and when they come and they complain about the kind, the, the way they have, they have been treated, the purpose with which they had entered into the uh, industry or the organization for learning through apprenticeship. So, there, it's, it's not only going to impact the uh, second batch, it's going to impact the current batch and the data is in front of us. I am witness to that data with many industries. However, there are good companies like for example, JVM I am giving because I can see them here and we have seen consistently growth in our, uh, in our student trainees or apprentices within JVM and the second question's answer lies in this, it's how you treat these people. How you create a skill matrix for the apprentices within the organization. How you rotate them on different job roles within the organization to give them opportunity to explore, expose and learn and unlearn certain things within the industry on different. For example, someone is on manufacturing, someone is in maintenance, someone is in operations, someone is in quality. When you give a holistic learning to a student, 100% student sticks and shares the same feedback with others. It's, let me tell you, it's not about the student learning. It's about the cascading effect on the industry. Because eventually when the student will leave, 90% uh, of the apprentices actually are absorbed by the same industry because they find them highly productive. Especially only those companies who actually manage apprenticeship in a right manner. The second reason is, why should not the employer do? I think employer intent is not uh, somewhere I question. I see there is a deterrent in the form of the awareness within its own employer ecosystem, its managers, its supervisors, its leadership team, how they see apprenticeship. Sometimes in the industry, it is the responsibility of the apprenticeship nodal officer of the employer and it is his job to get the apprentices and that's his KRA. While as the KRA actually extends beyond that nodal officer's job, it is the job of every manager, every supervisor in the industry to engage, retain and uh, motivate these youngsters and help them and mentor them so that they can grow and they can stay, they can learn and they can share the feedback with the rest of the students. One quick comment about what you said. Uh, I work with a company called Amaraja Batteries, one of the best companies in India. The chairman of the company is to live in Tripati. He used to run an apprenticeship program for his own employees. He knew most of the employees personally. And he came from his village. He was not, his main idea was to do something for his village. And it became a very successful program. My point to is, Dr. Nehru, and that's something Sanjay, he also might have to answer. How do we escalate this matter of apprenticeship skills to the CEO table, the promoter table? The moment promoter takes interest, everybody aligns in companies, right? How do we sensitize them? How do you make them see the value for themselves first? Forget about the country. Country that we can take later. They must see a value in doing for themselves. And we need to engage with CEOs. Yeah. Just to quickly add to this point, it's a very valuable question that one CEO level focus is definitely supposed to be there, but manager upskilling, the supervisory upskilling is very important. 
Number two, the institution, for example, our university and the industry, when we partner and collaborate, we have developed our own portal, which we, uh, which we uh, focus on, ensure, which we, we call it digital uh, OJT portal. So students who get enrolled on that, the employers, managers have to also assess on a weekly basis the students. Students also have to contribute ideas. Students have to improve uh, productivity. Students have to give certain ideas which can improve quality. So what happens where the interest of the managers comes up, when the student learning is linked to contribution on the shop floor or in the organization with different areas, and manager is able to understand that, consolidate that, and present it to the organization, then how this program that he or she is owning on his, in his line, in his department, is contributing towards the quality, ideation, productivity, I'm sure that if this kind of ecosystem is built, where the employer takes the responsibility, the institution, the academic institution takes the responsibility, and they jointly partner to strengthen this ecosystem, I'm sure it will definitely go beyond the 15%, and employers will see a significant impact of these youngsters who they train, they invest in, not only in their organization, but wherever they go, whether they may go in their supply chain, they can improve the quality, productivity, and help the growth of the organization. Okay, so thank you all, first of, um, you know, first of all, uh, for being very patient, listener, last 50 minutes, and then to after lunch, as what uh, said, is the most difficult, uh, you know, most difficult uh, time of the day. So I'll just, uh, you know, sort of keep uh, my views in broadly two parts. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what I think, uh, it's a very interesting panel. We've got institution being represented here, we, want, we have industry being represented here, and we also have a lot of industry practitioners as well as they've been on all uh, four sides. So uh, essentially, first part I'll address, I think, some of the provocative points that have uh, come up and just to, you know, add to that. Interestingly, I like uh, what Mr. Shiva has, uh, uh, you know, uh, shared, like, you know, there are four key stakeholders in the workforce development. That's the core topic that we are looking at. So, be it government, be it learner, be it industry, or be it institution. Incidentally, I was just reflecting, and I happen to be a part of all these four uh, groups at some stage or the other. So being a you know, part on government policy advisor, I've been a, you know, an industry practitioner as a CEO of uh, some of the large workforce related industries and also being in uh, education where we launched industry led programs and being a learner myself. I've changed perhaps four or five industry and also acquired new learn, you know, skills. So I can actually correlate uh, you know, the personal journey also and it's actually helped. So all that is actually needed is if we can, I think very well, uh, uh, put up by Mr. Shiva that you can put all the elements. Second part, I think, uh, uh, you know, I can uh, clearly say, I think uh, the way Mr. Varun said, let's be positive about it. And I think that is the need of the R for all of us. It's very easy for any one of us to say, industry is not doing this, learner is not doing this, government is not doing this. The question is, Believe you me, I think all of us, the very fact we are spending our precious time today in the whole day session of FIKI, and being a part of FIKI Skills Committee also, we spend a lot of time discussing this. And also as NSDC, being their strategic advisor, I can tell you each one of us has a role to play. Yes, this, you know, whether it's the policy, whether it's the scheme, whether what industry is doing, nothing is perfect. There are gaps, but as I think one rightly said, there's a step it's a, in the right direction and we need to start with that. Industry-led examples, uh, sorry, industry and institution partnership. So coming to, in my experience, I think wherever industry has got involved at an early stage with the institutions, there was no question of why they are So, uh, you know, I think as uh, Dr. Raj also rightly said, uh, there is no question of unemployment. If uh, all the programs, right from ninth till uh, you know doctorate, he's saying are industry led, and he's a you know seen it uh, himself, definitely the first break will come. Now whether that comes at a salary of ten thousand or fifteen thousand or blue, but that is all perhaps uh, you know needed for a learner today to get the first break. 
and as we know i mean at workplace there are multiple factors which are beyond your theoretical degrees or knowledge or even the skills that you have to today what is really needed at industry side is ultimately the attitude aptitude and also the confidence that the person has so if we can have industry led curriculum at irrespective of whether doctorate level or ninth tenth level or in the graduation level and if we can get the give the first break to the learner i think the confidence and the work skills etc will start getting you know will help him in the career and that is what will bring in sustainability and i have you know i'm uh, happy that he shared this point of bits and this i mean uh, aluminum so bits pilani myself i was involved that time from industry side while working with vivek at wipro and uh, you know we been uh, wanting to do more programs like this and at nit i was there for seven years we launched a program with icici neem rana this is perhaps the only mba where actually two we out of two years there are four uh, you know sessions six months the candidate learns at the university and next six months at icici you know premises another uh, you know six months back to university whatever they have learned and the final six months again at icici and the beauty of this is the regular mba recognized beauty of this is that the student and the learner see in any framework ultimately i always maintain that the onus of learning should be on the learner not on the industry not on the institute not on the government what we can do with our experiences how do we put that onus of learning on the learner so we did a very simple thing we told icici the day student joins the mba program the moment they pay the fee they will get provisional appointment letter of icici bank that day after that there was no issue of any you know attendance there was no issue of quality it was very clearly written if you don't have attendance 80 person if you don't clear your all the test in first attempt first attempt this appointment letter is not valid so i mean there are a lot of such good practices are being done yes looking at india scale these are perhaps not enough to impact every life we have a large population and i think the answer uh, that only also gave all of us you know looking at always the organized jobs it will not need last 14 15 years i've been involved right from day one of this skilling that we started in 2009 or even perhaps 2007 8 the discussion started and we've seen that ultimately the jobs so to say are at msmes i think he touched upon a brief point i go a step backward i say why do we even look at job we should look at overall livelihood as a broad category which will have organized jobs which will have unorganized job it will also have an income and that is the reason if we start moving employment as to overall livelihood perhaps the nano entrepreneur micro entrepreneur everybody will then fall in that category so a lot of uh, this thing needs to be done coming to these employment like incentive i think it's a step in the right direction today after apprenticeship after naps this is a you know especially for msme for large organization whether it is you know apollo whether it is atel whether it is all large service organization hero group this may not be enough but for msme if we check perhaps even this small 15000 rupees of one month is sufficient enough to motivate him to at least walk that path yes i think in terms of uh, you know implementation uh, challenges and others as uh, we were talking about there is enough experience in the system the processes the technology the digital as nsdc we have a sit portal from where we can see every classroom today live we it also has a facial recognition today malaysia and africa and middle east companies are coming and they say we want to apply and use this digital learning platform at our centers and our skill centers so let me uh, you know pause here and coming to two of your questions that how to do a sustainance of jobs i think there is no shortcut to upskilling the the jobs will keep changing whether it is with data science whether it is ai gen ai the business models will change and the moment business models change you know obviously the upskilling requirement will be there and yes i think uh, organizations uh, you know uh, are taking different routes somebody is saying i will hire fresh somebody is saying i will upskill people so there are both pros and cons nothing is right or wrong as long as each person is you know doing their bit or each element is doing their bit and i like the statement that i think uh, modli or prasichwa said i think it's high time that we should see after 10 years actually who are the beneficiary in the whole system is the learner and the industry and if 
the learner in the industry, how do we make them, you know, enable the whole thing and walk that path rather than only giving government roles and schemes. While that will always be there to support the, you know, uh, people who can't afford it, but as far as larger section of the, the societies are concerned, I think they should be able to do it on their own. So thank you so much. Only one question for you. Shiva raised a question that students should have a stake in this, right? The entire government scheme doesn't have a stake. Do you? What is your view on that? Absolutely, because otherwise that onus of learning doesn't remain on uh, the learner. And there was a phase I remember before, you know, the see, it's, it's a, actually a, a dilemma. If the government doesn't come out with free schemes for, uh, you know, the low income housing, then they say government is not doing anything. If uh, the government brings in that, then they say the student skin is not in the game. So both ways, you know, while there is a problem, but there is a large audience and the short term skilling program were working earlier also before the first free scheme I remember in the skilling was star scheme in 2011-12. But there were a lot of institutes running that time vocational courses and they were getting 15,000, 17,000, 20,000 for the short term skills because within two months of uh, their first job they were able to recover. So I think both the models will coexist. Our biggest challenge is the size of the population and the youth population. So whatever we do, firstly, will fall short, but let's not get disheartened. We need to continue every year, every budget, we need to continue to do these steps and keep taking feedback and learning as you know, as Bhavna was saying and Mr. Shiva, as long as we are at it, I'm sure, you know, already we are now inching towards being the largest, you know, or the whole world is perhaps looking at us in terms of the potential and our biggest asset is the large uh, youth population that we have. And I think the step is in the right direction while I, you know, partly disagree with Murli that uh, it is in the wrong direction. The direction is right. It's just that somewhere we just launch something and then we sit at it, wait for years, this will automatically work. We have to keep reviewing it every 15 days, first forward, first batch, talk to apprenticeship, how exactly. That is where we, you know, fail either as a training company or as a, you know, industry. If you keep doing that, the feedback and improvement, it will, uh, you know, it is the direction will be, you know, uh, absolutely right. Thank you. I think before I open the audience, I want to conclude because all of you have accused me of being negative. So I want to settle this right once for all. You see, one thing we have to learn when you come to this forum is to learn something. And my life, 30 years of IIT, IIM has taught me only one thing. If you don't ask a question why something is not happening, that is where the real story is. And that's where you learn. So our question was provocative to ask why employers are not supporting or whatever. So I don't want to say we are negative. We definitely appreciate the government. And I'm a great fan of NSDC because they've been the most progressive thing that ever happened to the skill industry is NSDC. I personally believe it. I'm not saying it for the sake of NSDC. But we need to learn to improve. And the feedback you're getting now is employer participation is the challenge. So a few questions to the audience and then we'll wind up. Dipti? Yeah, no comments, please. Please give only questions because comments will take it offline. Time is limited. If you have any questions for any of us, please ask. I request you not to give commentary. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for such an enriching uh, I could relate really with a lot of things. My name is Manan and I work for a foundation called Medha. We have partnered with the government of uh, Haryana and uh, now even UP in Uttarakhand for the implementation of a dual system training scheme, which is actually a flagship scheme of the MSD. Uh, I think before we start talking about institutionalizing the OJT and these internships, I would just want the panel to maybe address how do we solve the logistic piece of it. Because when we are trying to send 40, 60, 80, 100 students to different industries without catering to the commuting distance, without providing them a stipend, without, uh, like Mr. Nehru said, evaluating those learning outcomes or not having their formative assessments being done by the industry, these OJTs are actually only being more or less like unpaid labor, uh, not actually solving the problem that the OJTs and internships need to solve. So what does the panel think about it? I'll reframe the question for the audience. Yeah. Raj can answer it. The question is, there is a lot of student issues involved in terms of travel, staying there, getting the student side. So how do we address this OJT 
uh, the travel and the logistics and other issues to make it easy for the students to do. Just to quickly answer this, we, as you said, that not paying the stipend in the OJT, that's not how the university, at least we are doing, and we, most of the institutions today are coming to university to understand our model and replicate in different states. What we do is, for example, if we design a three-year degree program, and in that three-year degree program, the program is mapped to, say, for example, tool and die, or program is mapped to robotics, or program is mapped to mechatronics, or it may be a program in HR. In each of these fields where the undergraduate program is designed, we identify jointly with the industry, which is the partnering industry, that which are the job roles that are core, common, and critical for you where you want to curate certain skills. So in our three-year curriculum, we integrate job roles. Well, that's number one. The assessment every year is also done for those job roles besides the other components of the learning. The second important thing is, for example, if there is a three-year undergraduate degree, there is 60% of component which involves on-the-job training. Now the 60% of on-the-job training is also reimbursed as a stipend by the industry. All our agreements with the industry has the component of on-the-job training stipend. For example, I have an employer here and plant that they are here. Uh, JBM pays 10,000 rupees per month to a student. More than that sometimes, but 10,000 minimum to a student who enrolls in our university for a BWOC tool and die or BWOC robotics, which means by the time a student has completed his or her degree, they have earned around 2 lakh rupees during their 3 years internship in JBM. Not only that, they have also learned and understood experience across the uh, India, wherever they have placed them. And by the time they finish their program, JBM is uh, the first employer of choice for them. That employee has also opportunities outside. So what is important is governance, a good scheme, a good understanding with the employer, education of students, there are many other challenges, but it will not run simply by saying we will have to have an OGT. It requires a lot of uh, governing moving particles that are moving uh, areas that need to be integrated, monitored, governed, tracked, and then presented as a report every year to the employer, to the student, to their parents, to the institution. Thank you. Any other questions? Hello. Yeah. My question is basically like related to mass training model. So why we are not adopting mass training model at an India level, considering the number of you know young people and youth. So it can be very helpful. Uh, so can you come in? Can you repeat the question? We are not able to understand the question, please. So Somebody can explain. Yeah. My question is related to mass training model. Mass training model is basically mass killing model in which we can train number of youth like uh, considering like one like youth uh, in six months like that and it should be repeatable. That can be really helpful uh, considering the number of youth and uh, you know big problem of skills and all. Yeah, I think Dr. Raj, I think your example of three years storytelling. Yeah, but I want to talk about it. See, the point I think India we all accept, NSDC accepted really in the beginning that short term programs are the only way we can manage 10 million people, 100 million people to be skilled. Long term programs are not an option. Many people can't afford to pay. They can't wait for three years for a job. They need a job. So, mass training, I totally agree. So, I'm going to ask maybe Geo or somebody else to answer. The question is how do we convert this into a mass program rather than a limited? a few students, a few colleges, and few universities. I think that's the question. Anybody would like to answer it? You know, in India, in the NAPS program, National Apprenticeship Scheme, we have an optional trade element as well. Now, in India, how many employers here today have integrated NSQF with, which is the optional trade, uh, scheme of NAPS, which means if you are having NSQF based programs run mass across India and if they are integrated with the NAPS, I think one of the biggest problems today for exciting people to go into the mass based training which you are talking about, the NSQF short term programs can actually be seen on ground very effectively. But how many employers here are actually leveraging the optional trade scheme of NAPS? 
Yeah, so another uh, dimension to that is your question is that, see, one of the biggest challenges for mass training is the availability of good quality trainers across the country. So while in big cities or relatively state capitals, top 40, 50 cities, we can still get good trainers. But if you look at up country, so to say Bharat and, you know, the rural areas where there is large population and they also, when we talk about massification, I think that's where it's high time that we also need to start using the technology, where it can be done in a blended mode, whether it's a partly self, uh, you know, phase. And that is where perhaps I would say that as far as training skilling industry is concerned, massive investments will be needed in that area, that how do we really make it, use the technology available for doing training and skilling at a very mass and a large scale. And it's a very valid, uh, you know, point that you raised. And I think, uh, a lot of work is happening in that direction already, but it is definitely not enough and it is it needs to be stepped up. Right. Thanks. As a closing statement, I think we do a lot of mass training programs. We trained half a million people. And one of the most important component of mass training is there has to be intermediation between the employer and the employee. Staffing companies, for example, they are the biggest players in NAPS right now. They have become the intermediary role of doing it multiple locations, standardization of training, etc., etc. So I think there's no shortcut. A company and an individual cannot directly engage in mass training program. That's my view. So I want to thank the audience and uh, thank my speak uh, panelists for patience with me, especially. Thank you so much. Have a nice evening. <laughs>